All right, well, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, you're at the Meet the Editors 2.0 session, the top 10 mistakes we make in uh, medical education research. I'm Nick Kaman. I've been the chair of the um, Educational Research Interest Group here for the last three years. I'm cycling off and handing that over to Sarah Michael from Denver. Um, so if any of you are in that interest group, that's the interest group that sponsored this talk. Um, this is called 2.0 because we did a Meet the Editors panel uh, with the same group of people minus, um, at the time, Mike Fitch was editing for MedEd Portal and Dave Wald is subbed in for him. And I'm going to introduce each of the panelists here in a minute as we go through. Um, what we wanted to do with this is a couple things. We wanted to give you an opportunity to access the editors of the journals that um, publish medical education, research, and scholarship. So I think what we hope this can be is a conversation. Um, we actually don't have a lot of slides. You know, I think we, we want you to ask questions and, um, and we want the panelists to kind of expand on what they see us doing wrong. And hopefully by identifying these top 10 mistakes, um, we'll kind of also be able to talk about uh, the things that we can do right as well. Um, I don't have any disclosures. I do want to acknowledge a couple people, um, Jeff Love, Doug Ander, and Dave Way. And Dave's in the audience. Um, Dave is our educational research specialist at Ohio State. And you edit for um, the CDEM CORD education supplement for Western Journal of Emergency Medicine and what else? Pardon me? Okay, Medical Education Online. So um, these people also submitted some comments to mistakes that, that we make. So um, I'm going to go through, at the end of this session, hopefully you're going to hear about our high quality uh, outlets for educational research in emergency medicine. We'll discuss the top 10 mistakes made in medical education research. And the way we got these is um, when we proposed this session, I asked each of these folks to send um, the mistakes that they see people making over and over again in their submissions. And then we also went to the literature, and there's a couple of papers out there. There's some on mistakes people made, and there's some on best practices, so we looked at that as well. All right, so let's go through and meet the panelists. Our first panelist that um, I want you to meet is Dave Wald. So I've known Dave for a long time. He was um, the second president of CDEM. We've been working together um, in CDEM for a long time. And Dave, do you want to talk a little bit about, I have your slide up on MedEd Portal. Sure, so most people probably to uh, some extent are familiar with MedEd Portal. MedEd Portal originally started out as a repository for educational resources. And what's wonderful about MedEd Portal is it's really much more, and we could probably move on to the next slide just because it kind of segues into that. But MedEd Portal is much more about the product than the actual process itself. And, and what I found very interesting is MedEd Portal for me, certainly for the side of curriculum development, has really been a great place at times when you're looking to develop something at your own institution, whether it's on the undergraduate or graduate medical education side. It's a great place to start because I've certainly found on numerous occasions that someone has done something similar uh, to what I've thought about, and it may be a nice opportunity to kind of build upon other people's work. The, the nice thing with MedEd Portal is it's not as much about pure educational research as it is about putting out your curriculum. And the, and the key thing is it's curriculum that's already been at least piloted, and, and that's kind of a key thing. The, the opportunity for scholarship, I think, is very wide-ranging, and as of November of 2015, MedEd Portal really kind of changed their submission process to include what they call the Educational Summary Report, which is really analogous to a research manuscript. If we just move on to the next slide for a second, the, the important thing when you're, when you're teaching, obviously that's something that we all do, it's important, I think, in some ways to focus your teaching and teach with some scholarly focus. And Glassic's criteria that is listed here that was originally published in Academic Medicine in 1990 is really the format in which your submissions to MedEd Portal should be designed. 
And if, if you look at just some of the um, criteria there, it's somewhat analogous to developing a research paper in regards to background, methodology. Now, you do want to ultimately have some results, and it's nice that if your piloted curriculum, you know, has either some assessment metrics or some evaluative component. But again, I, I found it, and I think if you haven't spent time looking uh, on MedEd Portal, you'd be quite surprised about some of the high-quality submissions. And the nice thing also is it, it allows you to, uh, you know, use other people's ideas at your home institution, and it's really a one-stop shop. So all the curriculum that's published on MedEd Portal is really designed for you to have all the information available, all the appendices, all the um, instructor's guides to really t uh, transfer that to your home institution to develop either the same or, or something similar. So yeah, and if I could just add, I think it's a great place. Um, it's, it's on PubMed, um, and if you have a curriculum that you're developing, I'll give you an example. We built a curriculum around EPA 10. So um, EPA 10 of the 13 AAMC uh, core EPAs is taking care of a patient with an emergent complaint, which is kind of the EPA that I think belongs <laughs> to emergency medicine. So we wrote a couple of different cases. One's a, a patient who has a STEMI that turns into a pulseless VTAC, and the students have to take care of that patient. The other one is a demented nursing home patient with sepsis. So we put those cases together and we published them on the MedEd portal and then we published the curriculum as a whole in the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine Educational Supplement. And I think it's a good example of, you know, getting two pieces of scholarship kind of out of the same curriculum. So um, I, I think it's, it's great. and. Um, they also have, I don't know if you're going to talk about this later, but there's templates that you follow when you submit. So we'll probably talk about that when, when we get to the mistake of not following the, uh, the instructions. The author, right? Yeah. So next is Shannon Tui. She's the Associate Program Director at um, UC Irvine. And she's going to talk to us about JET EM. Uh, so when we created JetEM, um, MedEd Portal was the only education repository out there, and they were great, but I kept going to conferences and educational um, sessions, and people kept saying, you know, I wish there was something specific to emergency medicine. I wish it were easier to find these things, um, especially since EM is so at the forefront of FOMED and other technologies compared to other um, specialties, which I never realized until I was teaching other specialties, and they had no idea what FOMED was. So we... Uh, decided to create JetEM. Um, it's very similar to MedEd Portal, um, so they've already talked kind of a lot about this thing. So it's an educational journal repository. Everything has always been peer reviewed. There is a manuscript required uh, like them. We do require uh, some sort of piloting, some sort of evaluation, and some sort of results. Um, we cover a variety of content, so there's TBLs, small groups. Lectures are less common just because lectures aren't usually engaging, but if you have a really good lecture, we do accept them. Podcasts. Um, games and things like that. So we also have templates. Everything is fairly structured. It's based on Glassic, so it's fairly easy to go in and just kind of make sure you're following all the requirements. Honestly, whenever we make new educational content, we usually just pull a template. That way, when we're actually creating it, we're already following Glassic's um, steps and making sure we're going through the objectives, considering what we're trying to teach and the best methods to teach that. Uh, so. So the picture up there is, um, was my first experience with Jet EM. Um, took care of that patient in the emergency department that had acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis. And um, it's just a good example of, you know, everyone has a camera phone. We see a lot of great pathology. Get permission from your patient and submit it to Jet EM or another journal that publishes um, images in medicine. So. Yeah, so we have a, sole, a separate subset of visual e uh, case reports, just because most EM case reports are kind of more interesting cases and things like that. We take visual EMs, uh, which is also creating a very large image repository that are all open access. So if you ever need EM-based images, uh, Jet EM is a pretty good place to go for them. Great, thank you. So Shram Latvapur is next. Um, Shram is the editor for the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine, Integrating Emergency Care with Population Health. 
This is the one that you hear people call uh, West Gem. And um, some of his comments include um, Jeff Love, Doug Ander, and Dave Way, who um, help edit the educational supplement. Um, so I'll let you take it away in a second. I just want to introduce Dan Meyer, too, who is here. And he's a um, MedEd portal editor as well. So um, you know, I want to make sure that, that you guys have access to these folks. Shram, you want to talk about your journal? Oh, hi, uh, uh, Sharam here. So I'm one of the associate editors for the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine. Um, you know, really, the Western Journal is, we look at it, uh, the editor is Dr. Langdorf. We have uh, uh, numerous uh, decision editors, and we have a special issue, an education special issue, uh, that is uh, edited uh, by Dr. Uh, Love, Dr. Ander, and a whole slew of, uh, uh, it's really, uh, it's a huge team. And that's really how we've designed West Gem from the beginning. So we try to collaborate with every organization out there. We've wanted this to be 100% a service to uh, the, uh, the uh, culture and society of emergency medicine. So I'll talk specifically about the education issue and then kind of go into other stuff. So we, as, uh, as you know, some open access journals or uh, many open access journals have a small fee that is their article processing fee once you get your article accepted. So we, uh, when the special issue was created, uh, CDEM and CORD covered the cost of the issue, so they are the sponsor of the issue. So there's no article processing fee for any of the submissions to this issue. So as you know, the article sponsoring fee is after it's accepted, never at the beginning, never submit to a journal that would want you to pay a fee at the beginning, which there are some out there. And uh, so we get anywhere from 100 to 150 submissions for the special education issue. It's currently open, so feel free to submit your stuff if you're interested. And um, uh, we accept anywhere, there's not a set number, it's whatever the editors think is the right number. We accept anywhere from 30 to 40 or higher if they felt it was, uh, it was um, uh, uh, indicated. Uh, so the acceptance rate I don't think is bad, particularly you know, 30 to 40 percent acceptance rate. Uh, and I think that's pretty good for an education um, uh, research uh, journal. We have, um, you know, many different categories, uh, as you can see, um, or, or I don't back. know which slide we're back. on. I went to the other one, but I went back. To okay, those uh, we have now. original research, brief research, systematic reviews, which not often people do in um, education, educational advances and uh, innovations. Um, you know, we're fully online, so if you have videos, if you have teaching uh, material, we put all of it open access online from the very beginning. So we really encourage having, in addition to the print material, some other mechanism of engaging the audience. And I think we all do, but uh, I think, you know, from the beginning we've really felt that to be an important part. There's no limit to what the size of these things are. We're very fortunate. Our backbone is the UC Office of the President eScholarship, um, uh, which is their open access platform. So they've, uh, we've never had a limit to that, which makes our lives very simple. And people can post lots of videos and supplementary uh, material. Um, so, you know, the nice thing about CDEM and CORD is we cover both the undergraduate and the graduate medical education. Uh, the submissions are pretty broad. Uh, if for some reason they don't feel it's appropriate for CDEM cord, um, you know, we've had requests before, so, you know, can this be considered for it? Uh, you know, for the regular West Gem issue, I, I think that's always a possibility, but it's only if they don't feel for some reason, uh, you know, CDEM cord is the right avenue for that. Uh, we really have all the educational articles for the few months earlier in the year go through the CDEM Court uh, special issue. Great. Thank you. Susan Promise is here from uh, Academic Emergency Medicine Education and Training. Do you want to tell us about your journal? Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Great. 
So um, academic emergency medicine and training has been around for about three years now. The journal continues to grow. It's published quarterly. Um, it was set up really for the community that's sitting in this room, for educators. It's about education and training in emergency medicine. Um, we have various different article types, the typical article type of, you know, original research, but there's other unique things to medical education. We have um, a category called New Ideas in Bedside Teaching, um, and it's really about educational reports. We have um, an education case conference to identify problems encountered between a learner and the teacher. We have innovations reports. We have another new category that is just starting that you'll learn about. We haven't even um, put it out to everyone to, to learn a lot about called SOAR. It's a kind of a joint project with um, kind of the foam med community with SAM to really review kind of what is out there and to categorize things based on um, the quality of the work. So when you want something right at point of care to look things up, which ones should you look at? Because there's so much material to look at. So that's going to be sore. You'll hear more about that soon. We really haven't rolled it out yet, except we've published one as kind of a demo of what we're looking for. Um, we are always looking for reviewers. So if there are people that are really, I think, interested in educational research, have published in this area, it's a great opportunity, I think, to even refine your skills. I, I don't know, for people in the room that are reviewers, I learn so much when I read other people's papers. It makes me go learn about methodology that maybe I didn't know, um, um, go back and look at the literature. So there's opportunities in that front as well. Our journal is, is open access after one year. So after an uh, issue has come out and has been out for a year, then everything is open access. But we don't charge any fees for publishing, so it's, it's free to everyone up front. Um, articles get PubMed IDs, so we're in PubMed Central. We're also in Scopus. Great. Thank you. And just, I, I told Sharon this, they are recording this session, so if people can go back and listen to it, they can. Um, these are a couple of the other venues for scholarship. I think a lot of you guys know about these, but the Journal of Grad Med Ed, Academic Medicine, Medical Science Educator. Um, I think I really like looking at these journals because it allows me to see kind of what other specialties are doing. Uh, these are some of the other ones, and there's a, um, a link at the bottom of this. So if you go to that link, it gives you a whole list of different um, venues for scholarship. This is from the AAMC Regional Group on uh, Educational Affairs. So, you know, these are kind of the more prominent ones. As far as traditional medical journals, these are ones that you can consider, but most of these don't um, publish just specific educational research. Um, some of them do publish education occasionally, but I think these are tougher nuts to crack than the other ones. Um, and then finally, uh, there's more coming online every day. Um, so these are some more. Perspectives in medical education, I think, is one that I've been looking at more recently. Um, they've had a couple of issues of that featured on the Key Lime podcast, which if you don't listen to the Key Lime podcast, it's a... It's a podcast that reviews educational research papers and does a pretty good job of that. So why don't we go ahead and... Can I make yeah. one comment? Please. Um, are people aware of JANE, that website? So JANE stands for um, Journal Author Name Estimator. So if you're writing a paper or wrote a paper and you have an abstract, you can put in either keywords, put in the abstract, and hit journal. And it gives you suggestions of journals where you may want to submit your ideas for publication. So um, it's not something I've used a lot, but I've been in multiple meetings where people have been talking about this, so I've been looking around. So it might be something to put in kind of your repertoire, Jane, J-A-N-E. Um, so journal, author, name, estimator. Great. So... Again, what we did here for the folks that came in a little bit after is I emailed these folks when we were putting this together to send what they think the top mistakes we make as educational researchers and academicians in emergency medicine. And so what I did is I put some of their comments up there, but I'll, I'll let everyone um, 
certainly chime in. So the first mistake that we wanted to talk about is not justifying the study. So Dave, you sent me a comment or a quote that said insufficient educational context for the innovation and the submission doesn't contribute to the field. Um, I think, Shannon, you sent me a quote, needs assessment not appropriately addressed to allow proper instructional design. And Shram, you said lack of appropriate question that's answered by the study presented. So talk a little bit about, maybe we'll just start here and go down this way, um, about justifying the study in medical education research. <laughs> Um, so, again, JEDIM's a little bit different, like MedEd Portal, we're, we're a general repository, everything's peer reviewed, but the purpose is the actual content and making something that other people can very easily open and utilize and have everything there. Um, but before you make anything, before you're ever creating education, you really need to focus on why you're doing it and what gap you're filling. And so sometimes we get things and it's, you know, kind of a sloppily put together curriculum or a simulation and the objectives don't actually meet what they're doing and they clearly didn't actually look at what their learners were trying to figure out and what they needed so they didn't properly define the gap they were trying to close which subsequently results in inappropriate objectives and object methodology that doesn't match that. So um, it's a little bit different than I'm sure what uh, Dr. Promis and Dr. Lofpour are going to talk about but if you're creating educational content that you want to publish for others to use you really need to make sure that all of those line up properly. Did, did you think that that was in some of those examples that, that you mentioned earlier? You had, did you think that somebody had written a simulation scenario and then tried to make it fit, like a figure, try to say, we're going to make sure that everybody can find every cardiac abnormality on this EKG, like too lofty of an objective that then wasn't satisfied by the goals at the end? I think that's part of it, and I think some of it is people just trying to get their scholarship, which I totally understand. I think a bigger part of it is we're not well trained to be educators unfortunately you know we decide to go into academics but unless you get a master's in it which most of us don't do it's very hard to actually have the proper background so we think oh well I made the simulation it should be meeting these things but they actually don't understand the process and so we try to lay everything out and really well explain it but we find people that don't even know what smart objectives are and so their objectives are very vague and unattainable. Um, so I th honestly, I think a lot of it is more the background and they had something and they want to get it published, which I totally get. And we actually will go through multiple rounds of helping our authors and trying to be like, here's where these need to be pr pr improved. And if there's enough changes, they have to repilot it. Um, but we, we do want our authors to kind of get there. So we, we try to help them. I think along that same theme is when you're thinking of what your research question is to really have a systematic way to think about it. I don't know if you guys have heard kind of using the mnemonic finer, so a finer research question. So is it feasible? Is it interesting? Is it novel? Um, is it ethical? And is it relevant? So think through each of those steps as you, you know, devise your question and develop it. And obviously there's lots of steps to each piece of that, but I think a framework is helpful when you kind of move through it. You know, I think traditionally um, a lot of the research, um, you know, the most the folks that are the most excited about are a lot of junior faculty, a lot of people involved in education which is perfect, but I think it's good to get maybe some other people's opinions on sometimes on some of your studies, um, you know, pitch it to people that are not within your tight circle and just make sure that what you think is the justification for why you did this or why you're going to do this, hopefully you do it before you do it, actually makes sense. So I, I think it's really just getting, getting to the heart of why, why you did it and does it really meet what you're trying to do. It's all, it's all about the question. You guys know that already. We're not telling you what you don't, but it's really getting other people's opinions so you fine tune it. And just to emphasize, you know, for these uh, journal outlets that publish curricula, the key is to have a strong approach to building your curriculum. So the Kern six step approach or backwards design where you use Bloom's taxonomy to develop your objectives, you tie your objectives, to your assessments, and then you decide what your teaching and learning methods are. I know for me, early in my career, it was just about here's the teaching and learning method. Here's this cool sim that we're doing. But there is no needs assessment. Why do we need to do it? What were we trying to teach? Um, so those are things that, that I think just to emphasize, you know, you talked about the needs assessment. 
that's one of the first steps in Kern's approach is why, why do students need this thing that you're teaching? Um, the second mistake that you all sent out, oh, I'm sorry. No, I mean, I, I was, what I was just going to add is it, it's very common, you know, early on for people to start in the middle and not start where they're supposed to. Right. And, and you know, if you look at both JEDEM and MedEd Portal where it's more about kind of curriculum development to, to an extent, mm -hmm. if you start by just thinking about why you're doing something, Right. And, and that's, the, that's the whole issue with the needs assessment. It's what, you, what is the gap that you're trying to fill? And I think part of the problem with some of the submissions that, that I've reviewed is there's not an adequate background and introduction to why it's necessary. Mm -hmm. And then you also have to think about, you know, is it really something that is truly adding to the literature or to the body of knowledge about that particular topic? And, and that's definitely something where if you're going to develop a curriculum from scratch, if you don't do it in an organized fashion and if you don't at least sit back and think what's been done in the past, what can we build upon, what's the, the, the deficiency or gap in knowledge that we're trying to, you know, overcome, then you're already starting out with poor methodology and it's going to be a problem. Great. So um, mistake number two on our top ten list is incomplete literature review. And some of the comments that you can see on the screen Susan said not doing a comprehensive lit search prior to embarking on a project. Um, Shram and Dave and others, no conceptual framework for framing the research, uh, either from not knowing the literature or not a, a deep enough level. Um, choose citations by looking at titles or abstracts without reading the, the article often leads to a uh, selection of inappropriate citations that don't support the statement or the assertion made in the literature. Um, so why don't we talk about that for a minute, doing a, a, an incomplete literature review. So one of the most common reasons that I as an editor reject a manuscript is because people just didn't realize that what they think is novel has already been done. It may be been done in a slightly different setting, but it really isn't interesting. And I feel bad sending those letters to people. Like, I read it and I immediately decline it, sending it out for review because they didn't do their homework. And it wasn't like there probably wasn't an opportunity there to do something different or a slightly different bend, but they just didn't even know about that. So I think I can't say enough to really do a lit search before you get in. Don't just look at titles, read them, see what the manuscripts say. Sometimes it'll help you identify a conceptual framework so you can build upon it and model that in whatever your research is. Um, using a librarian is really helpful. I mean, I do lit searches, but I know the librarian's way better than I am. So if it's something I really, really care about, I'm going to have a librarian help me with a lit search. I don't know what the rest of you guys do, but um, that's helpful. Yeah, so, you know, our program, these are, by the way, from uh, Dave Way, uh, both of these comments, excellent comments. You know, our program started an educational uh, journal club. Um, I think that's a great way to really get people excited and do some deep literature searches. I think traditionally, you know, we've had med students work with librarians, med students work with ourselves, and, you know, really try to get as much into it. But, you know, I just not, I don't, have them just do a literature search. I have them read it and summarize and we talk about each one and you know it's not just the abstracts and it's definitely not just the title. So and it takes time and I know that's why you know there's there's shortcuts. I've done it. You know that's why we do it. But we're trying to give you the high road here, not what we've done. <laughs> so just one yeah go ahead Dave. Yes, they great point. Yeah, and the thing I would add is um, do, submitting a project without doing a um, adequate lit review and, and the editors know that somebody did exactly what you did is a mistake. It's not a mistake to purposefully replicate an educational research project at another site. We probably don't do that enough. 
something works at the University of Michigan, I don't know if it works at Ohio State or if it works at, in Pittsburgh or somewhere else. So um, I think if you're purposeful about replicating a study, that's one thing, um, but it's not okay to just turn this out and you find out somebody did the exact same thing three years ago. We're on to mistake number three, which is study, the next couple of mistakes I titled mistakes with study design. So the next three or four of these are all about the study design. So this one is about comparisons. So um, Sharam talked about use of a pre-post-test design, um, a study where a class had a pre-test, some instruction, then a post-test and showed a large game. You've compared something um, to nothing. Essentially, it's accepted in the medical education research. If you add some type of education, people are going to get smarter. Um, and so uh, doing a pre-post test isn't going to get you where you need to be. Um, you know, what, what one of the papers I looked at said that um, A plus B is always better than A. And so this design of just adding something, testing your learners before you've added it, and then testing them after is not going to be a strong study design. So, so you know, you I, I'm comment. sure I didn't say this, and I don't remember he did. It was, uh, you know, great. Some I asked a whole bunch of people for comments, and one person sent me this. I wish I remembered who it was. But, you know, one way to get around this, you guys know this, if you're trying to compare two things, not compare something to nothing, but if you're trying to compare two things is, you know, randomize it, you know, give one instruction first and then give the other instruction so everybody serves as their own control. So there's lots of ways to do what you're trying to do. It's just this is the easiest one for us to do. You know, we're planning to do something. We ask questions about them ahead of time and what's afterwards. I'm just not sure this is really what you're trying to uh, advocate for, for somebody else to do it. And I think we can absolutely do better. We should do better as academicians. You know, if you think of, this is a great one to talk about frameworks. So I would put Kirkpatrick's model, looking at that for a framework. You know, what do you expect? And we want an outcome at the end that's going to change patient care, right? It's not like somebody just took a test and got better. We want to know if we educate people on a sepsis criteria, um, curriculum that your mortality from sepsis goes down. Like that's our goal. That's why we do these things. So I think thinking of in that framework, how do we get to the outcome that gets to the patient, right? That's why we're in medicine. Those are the better ways to design educational things. They're harder, much harder, but you know, how do we get there? Not, gee, I like this course or yeah, I did well right after I took it. Okay, my son isn't in medicine, but I bet you he could do that. You know, so you got to think about what, what really matters. How can we get to that next level? Because we can do it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll try and answer it. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like, because I'm new to this whole thing, so I'm trying to jump in the meta big trip, and it seems like, you know, the, the end goal of that is like, I'm going to roll out an education, an undergraduate medical education in sepsis or registering or, or teach something to my residents and then try to look at, like you said, sepsis outcomes in my hospital. Holy smokes, that's a lot of other ancillary stuff that's involved then show a difference and I coming from a bioscience literature, if you tell me that you gave an educational thing to your residents and your sepsis went down by a quarter of a percent, I can't ever say that that was due to just that. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, so, absolutely. So like no, I, I actually, so I, I agree with her. So it's, that's the goal, and that's what we should shoot for. But I really think it's very possible. So you could pull, you know, you've done this education. Not that we're saying do this in every instant. We're trying to get you guys beyond this, right? right? So that's what we're trying to say. But you could easily pull 50 charts. You, you've done an education. You pull 50 charts before. You pull 50 charts. I realize it's work, but you can do this. It doesn't have to be mortality, and it doesn't have to be QI related. So there's lots of ways to do this. And, and he, Sure.
And, and it really depends what you're focusing on, yes. right? I mean, That's you right. know, if you look at central line training, I mean, how long did it take before you can really prove that simulation training in central line training decreased, you know, bloodborne infections? I mean, very, very difficult. But w like one project we did at our institution a number of years back is we identified that we didn't feel our residents and they didn't feel they were comfortable in death telling. So we developed kind of a uh, standardized patient simulated kind of workshop on death telling. And we got some survey information before the, uh, the workshop. We got some information after the workshop. And then a few months later, we resurveyed the residents to determine if any of the kind of quote unquote skills that they learned in the workshop, did they actually apply that in real life situations over the next few months. So there's, there's ways to identify that you can change behavior. Obviously, identifying true you know, patient care outcomes are, 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 are very it's challenging. Harder. But I think what Susan said, by really looking at Kirkpatrick's model, what we really want to move way past is the reaction level, like did you like what we did? I mean, that, that is, you know, or do you it's think right. you learned something? But, but there's ways when you implement curriculum that you can identify that there, there are some delayed changes in behavior that can demonstrate that it's an effective curriculum. And the one thing I would add is, um, you know, with, with JDM, one of our priorities was getting things out there. Again, I was meeting all these learners who were making these great things, and I'd meet 12 other people who were also reinventing that exact same wheel. And it just seemed unfortunate instead of building upon others' work. So we really want to get the content out there. We do require some sort of evaluation. I have no problem with A plus B and is going to be better. And I'm okay with that because you still evaluated it. Now, I agree. The gold standard is you know, the higher levels of Kirkpatrick, seeing behavior, seeing patient outcomes. Those are great things. They're really hard to do, like you're saying. And I really hate to discourage junior faculty members who are just getting into this. So you know, one of the better, what a great way to do it was I created an educational curriculum. I published it with JDM with my initial evaluations. I taught it for five more years. I did a bunch of chart reviews, and at that point, I published it with Susan. <laughs> and so, so I think there's opportunities, because I don't think that's unethical, because the data you're publishing with her is completely different than the curriculum and the initial results you published with us. So I would say, you know, they both have value, yes, for, for <coughs> ultimately knowing which pieces of education work, we are trying to get to those higher level Kirkpatricks. Most of us teach graduate medical education. We have 20 learners. It's really hard to do randomized control trials and tell half of them they're not gonna get this cool intervention we made. Um, and so it's very difficult to do. And so I still say something is better than nothing, but yes, you may not get into some of the higher, more indexed journals. And, and sometimes so you can get something published by just evaluating the curriculum, but if you wanna get published in a different venue, that's where you have to assess the learner. So yeah. it really depends on, and, and I agree, it's not, your, I mean, you are in some ways killing two birds with one stone, but you're, you're setting the, 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 the groundwork by developing the curriculum and publishing it, but also down the road, you should have that future goal of assessing. Why don't, we, why don't we hold off, because we have 11 minutes left and six more mistakes to get to. But I, I'm not going to volunteer their time, but I'm going to tell, you know, they'll probably be able to hang out maybe a little bit after this. But... You can definitely find these folks through the app. Um, but let's, let's move forward just so we make sure we get through all the mistakes. And then um, we can kind of go forward. So you, you had talked about data. And the next mistake is study design and talking about data. So um, these are some of the quotes that was, <coughs> were sent out, not consulting with a statistician prior to embarking on a study, not applying appropriate methods for the question. Educational content has not been piloted or evaluated. Again, um, Shannon, you mentioned, and, and Dave has as well, that um, MedEd Portal and JetEM require that you've, you've done the curriculum and that you have some information on it. Um, and then uh, Sharam and others talked about uh, sample size, single center, no clear hypothesis, conclusions are not supported by the data, poor survey design, um, insignificant of results and assessment tools that lack validity. Um, let's take two minutes maybe and have one person uh, comment on this. I guess that's me. <laughs> 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 um, 
I think the comments speak for themselves. You know, it's really doing your homework up front. I'll give you a, an example of kind of how collecting data to me was a big deal. So, um, you know, sometimes people put in Likert scales. They don't follow the typical Likert, but they give it like, say, a one to a five, right? And they report out data as, well, the overall score is 2.7, or, or let's say it's four. Well, is a four double what a two is? You know, it really depends how you describe your data, what, what you use to collect that data. Some things are better qualitatively than quantitatively. So you really need to speak to people that understand that. And I would say do the sniff test, have other people, you know, talk to them about it. Does this make sense to you? Do you, you know, kind of like you spoke about before. Sometimes we're too close to a project. It, it seems perfect to us, but you need other people to help give you information to lead you in the right direction. Great, so continuing with study design, this one, you guys all sent me this, so this, this was something that resonated, and that's that a study isn't generalizable. So um, Dave, you sent submissions not generalizable to other institutions, uh, lack of understanding of how to produce results that can generalize to others. Um, I got this quote out of a paper, um, 12 tips on how to get, not get your paper published, so it was a pretty good, paper for this, and they said the only people that care about the education of pediatric gerontologists in Lower Volga are pediatric gerontologists in Lower Volga. Essentially saying, you know, why do people care about this and will they want to do it at your shop? So, somebody want to comment on what you've seen with that? Well, I mean, I think specifically for curriculum that you're trying to get published, it has to be marketable to other institutions. It can't be uh, something that is just not able to be applicable to other sites. Your, your site's own personal stroke protocol, which is different than standard, you know, that is not going to be usable for anyone but you. So I would think about, too, with curricula that harness things that are unique to where you're at. So, um, you know, you may have access to a, something toxicology, EMS, disaster medicine, where you know it's not going to be something that they can have somewhere else. So definitely to think about that. Um, let's stay with study design as we kind of keep moving through this. And the next one you guys talked about was measurement. So this kind of fits with data, it fits with comparisons, it fits with study design. Um, one of the quotes I got was issues with measurement. This usually involves the use of an instrument like a survey that wasn't pop properly developed. I think, Dave, you might have sent this. Yeah, Dr. Wade. He's, he's kind of a survey uh, guru. Didn't make an attempt to establish content validity through expert review or pilot testing, response process, or validity. Um, so talk about that for a minute. Oh, I think I, I would have Dr. Way. He's here. Yeah. Please do. <laughs> It's off, though. Yeah. Uh, because they're unaware of resources that are already available. Uh, I, I would turn you to... Uh, I don't know how to turn this one on. Uh, it's on. There's, there's it's a on. Uh, mental measurement yearbook for boroughs I don't think that um, has a lot of measures that are mostly freely available. Um, I, I think most academic libraries have access to the boroughs mental measurement or test and print. Um, there's also another I just want to encourage all of us, uh, both authors and journals, to publish the instrument. So either as a supplemental content or some other way that it's freely available. So, you know, I'd encourage the authors to be willing to share it. I'd encourage the journals to be willing to put it in its entirety. Because without those instruments out there, you know, nobody's going to email somebody, you know, 
a year, five years, ten years down the road, can I have this? Is the email the same? Is the institution the same? Is, you know, does the person, so it's just, it's very important in the days of open access and putting our stuff out there to really have as much out there that somebody else can use it. And, you know, don't be afraid to reach back to something that's a few years ago and actually ask them for the instrument. And most people would say yes. So the next one we actually already covered. We talked about this when we were talking about publishing curricula to Jet EM and to MedEd Portal. And for that matter, uh, you know, all four journals that are represented up here. And that um, you two sent. There's a mismatch between the educational objectives and the instructional content. Learning objectives are not covered in the content. So again, if you're going to publish a curricula, it needs to be you know, built based on you know, kind of what the standards are, Kearns, backwards design, others, um, and not just be a teaching and learning method that you think is, is interesting. Um, the next one we also kind of talked about a little bit, but I'll throw it to the panel, and that's a single site educational innovation. Um, and I think one of the comments was, I do think the greatest loss of opportunity given our culture of collaboration in CDEM and CORD is sticking to a single center and not involving other universities. So this is just a pet peeve of mine, guys. You guys all work together. You guys are all friends. We should be doing all of our, all of our research at multi-sites. I mean, it should be a mission of CORD and CDEM to push and say, it, it cannot be from the journals, from us telling you, you have to do this to go to the next step. It's got to be really a societal thing, a culture of collaboration. You, you are like best friends with each other. I don't get why you don't take one IRB and give it to another person and have six sites, have 10 sites, have 20 sites, but have more than one site for God's sakes. So this is definitely <laughs> something uh, you can tell I feel a little, little strong about. Mainly because, you know, the, the, you know, when I started and, you know, some of the other people on the panel, and we didn't have what you guys have nowadays. You know, uh, it's not like, you know, I walked up, you know, uphill both ways, but, you know, th it's a different, uh, different availability of resources you guys have different amount of collaboration, different amount of culture of uh, knowing each other and what, what's going on at other instances. Just to Sorry. add on to that really quickly, one of the long-term goals of JetEM is to create um, you know, validated surveys that we know we've had 26,000 downloads of our content since we started three years ago. So we know people are using our content. So one of the long-term goals is to get those people who use it to actually use a standard evaluation and start collaborating to get publications at multiple sites, since we know multiple sites are using our content. Oh, just one other right. thing. So the easiest way for me not to pre-screen something out of West Gem is if it's more than one site. I will never pre-screen something out. I will have, it's got to go through, it's got to get reviewed, all of this. But if it's a single site and it's a survey, that's an easiest one that I can pre-screen out because I'm like, you know, why? And so just, <laughs> I just want to add that little. Right. Yeah. So two more mistakes. Um, the next one I think is fairly self-explanatory and a lot of these, um, when you read these reviews, uh, this is oftentimes the first one is follow the instruction for authors. Um, some of the things that people talked about is authors don't adequately read the guidelines and um, they fall short of expectations and they don't adequately address the revisions or reviews of the editors. Or so. I would say when revisions come back, people have snarky comments. Come on, gang, be nice. <laughs> they get to decide if they're going to accept your manuscript. Like I, I really, I read some of these, I'm like, are you kidding me? It's okay though to disagree. Like if you read it and someone suggested you change something, you just need to have a coherent reason why you don't think you should do it. Maybe someone just didn't understand something and that'll help clarify it, but just be nice, be professional. <laughs> So, just read the author instructions. I'm sure this happens in Meta Portal, but we just get straight research. And I'm like, you didn't even look at my website. <laughs> you didn't look at anything we've ever published, and you didn't look at my instructions for authors. You just took a manuscript that was rejected elsewhere and submitted through my, me, my portal and wasted my time. <laughs> and, and I'll just add the comment, and I know Dave and, and Dan has probably experienced this, but these folks read all the other journals. So they know what a manuscript for teaching and learning in medicine should look like. 
And if you submit it to WestGem in the structure of teaching and learning in medicine, they know where it was. And, um, and, and I've, I'll be totally honest, I made that mistake early in my career. Like, oh, it got rejected, let me try this one. Well, they don't use the same you know, results, methods. They might use aims instead of objectives. And so you really have to pay attention to that. So we're, we're right at time. The last one, um, actually no one mentioned, but I saw it mentioned in the literature a couple times. So it's mistake number 10, hold the salami. Um, this article talks about what's called salami slicing. And essentially what this is, is trying to do separate uh, studies out of the same thing and, and cutting it up or submitting something in a slightly different format that's already been accepted to another journal. And <clears throat> it, it's also a reminder to me to remind you that we need ethical practices. So things like honorary authors, uh, things like not getting IRB, you know, we're not allowed to experiment on residents or medical students. So this last mistake is just to remind people to have ethical practices when they publish in the medical education research and not try to kind of cut things up. So um, I'm going to finish with some final pearls. You know, choose the right journal, adhere to ethical uh, principles, get your curriculum where it needs to be in order to be published, uh, prepare the cover letter, review it with peers, and, um, and you'll be all set. So uh, let's go ahead and, and wrap up. If we could thank our panelists, that would be wonderful. And I think for you, I, I really appreciate the audience participation. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm co-chairing the Medical Student Symposium, so I'm going to leave to go over there. But um, I'm available via the app or email. Um, the slides are on the app. This was recorded. And you are all available through your journal via email. And I guess the last thing I would just say, and, and you all can comment, is it's always it, it's always easier to work with a journal editor when you're going through the publication process or even when you're getting your study together. So I would also encourage you guys to do that as well. So great. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your attendance.